And the United States' pivot to Asia back on track, economic engagement and returning the focus to China, all likely priorities as President Joe Biden visits key allies, South Korea and Japan. So much of the future of the world is going to be written here in the Indo-Pacific over the next several decades. We're standing at an inflection point in history where the decisions we make today will have far-reaching impacts on the world we leave to our children tomorrow. And for more on Joe Biden's tour of Asia, we're joined by Ross Feingold. He's Director of Business Development at Safe Pro Group. Uh, Ross, we just heard uh, that a headline from my colleague. Washington's pivot to Asia is back on track. Or some would argue that Mr. Biden never took his eyes off the primacy of Asia, whether he was withdrawing from Afghanistan, whatever Russia might choose to do in Ukraine. Would you agree with this? And do you see the borne out in these visits to South Korea and Japan? Well, all U.S. presidents or recent presidents make this claim. You know, they say that this century is going to be the Pacific century or some variation on that. We just heard that from President Biden. But again, I think his pre recent predecessors have all said the same thing. So at some level, they've all been in Asia or they've all been interested in Asia, whether it's uh, trade agreements when those were popular, security arrangements, especially after 911, uh, more recent years with regard to China. So they're all here at some level, but the issue always has been, is it sustainable? Because there are other issues, whether it's domestic or other foreign policy priorities or pressures that, that sort of cause their, their desire to be heavily involved in Asia to dissipate. And I think we see that with the Biden administration as well. Uh, one criticism, and I'll follow up from there, is the, the lack of a serious, sustained, substantial economic component in the U.S. relationship with Asia, including South Korea and Japan. China, of course, South Korea and Japan's largest trade partner. So if the U.S. wants to challenge Chinese uh, supremacy, it needs to bulk up this component. The Indo-Pacific economic framework, with its absence of any trade access to the American market, uh, does it in any way address this imbalance? It's a reasonable criticism to make. Uh, the, during the presidential election campaign in 2020, Biden said he would do things a little bit differently with regard to China. But uh, at least when it came to tariffs up to now, even though there's talk about changing that, he's maintained the tariffs. I uh, obviously didn't uh, advocate for the U.S. to join the CPTPP. That's not popular domestically or politically in the United States. Uh, the framework, uh, as you noted, it, it's, it, it's, it's a lot of talk. It, it's a lot of stuff about we'll, we'll be on the same page with like-minded countries with regard to data privacy and, and Internet protocols and things like that. Uh, but it's, as you said, it's not an access, not a trade agreement. And, and then more recently, the ASEAN summit, the amount of money that the U.S. proposed to spend, $150 million, a lot of people here in, in Asia thought that that was an awfully small amount. And it's very small compared to when China offers a very large, for example, infrastructure funding package to countries in Asia. So the Biden administration is definitely struggling against that criticism. And unfortunately for them, they, they've yet to really come up with something of substance, although there, there is a lot of talk. And like I said, there's a lot of talk about staying together with the like-minded countries, whether that's Japan, uh, South Korea. Sometimes it means Taiwan. Sometimes it doesn't. In some of the countries in Southeast Asia. But again, the substance often seems to be lacking. So rather than talking about uh, clean energy, digital standards, what Asia might like to see serious infrastructure uh, investment, as an example, uh, perhaps uh, free trade access, joining a free trade deal such as the CPTPP. Would that, is there any other way round not joining a free trade deal? You know, they could enhance some of the bilateral agreements or have many trade agreements. Uh, the, the political uh, schedule in the United States, though, makes those things very, very difficult because we're now within six months of the midterm election. Really, the time to do these things would have been in the first few months of the Biden administration. And then he could have uh, legitimately said, I'm trying to achieve things that the Trump administration did not achieve uh, by broadening some of those relationships. Uh, but now uh, any kind of trade agreement to go to Congress, I mean, that, that's all but a non-starter in the coming few months. And then if the Republicans take control of uh, the House and or the Senate uh, in November, then it becomes even more difficult in the final two years uh, of the Biden 
presidency. So it seems the more realistic uh, goal for President Biden is to encourage more Japanese or South Korean investment in the United States and specifically in, in semiconductors or the tech supply chain. And there's been some success in that regard. And also with regard to Taiwan as well, TSMC did announce a big investment in the United States. So that's probably something that Biden is also pursuing. It doesn't necessarily help the two economies when some of their largest uh, semiconductor companies expand their presence in the United States, but it does deepen the relationship. And, and politically, it would obviously be very good for President Biden if he was to uh, persuade large Japanese or South Korean companies to announce very significant investments in the United States. Uh, thanks very much for that. Ross Feingold, Director of Business Development at SafePro Group.